Hello from San Francisco. This is uh, Patrick McGee from the Financial Times, and I'm quite excited about this um, upcoming interview. We've got 30 minutes with John Kravchik. He is charismatic, he is energetic, and he is the CEO of Waymo, formerly known as the Google Self-Driving Project, which goes back to 2009. They um, are really in, I mean, I think pretty basically you could say they're the leading self-driving slash driverless slash autonomous robo-taxi service um, Operating, they, they, they operate the only um, real driverless service in Phoenix right now. They, I believe, test in 25 cities, including um, on my streets. It's even possible that I'll flip the camera at some stage if a Waymo goes by. They've done more miles autonomously than any other driverless company. And uh, if we really want to get a sense of when this technology might change our lives, I think there's nobody better to speak with than John Kraftchuk, CEO of Waymo, who uh, is joining me here. So hello, John. Hey, Patrick. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having us. You. You've got the Waymo mug uh, very nicely placed just over your, your you shoulder. Do. Yeah, Waymo mug is strategically placed. And uh, over my other shoulder, there's the little Firefly prototype. Oh, wait, I can't see it. It looks. I, I feel like I see a globe. Oh, I see just above that. Yes. All right, we'll get to the Firefly in a, in a second, because that's that's really interesting. There you go. Um, yeah, this is your this is your, your no pedals, no steering wheel vehicle. Um, but you've moved beyond that, and actually, that's something that I want to get to in a little bit. I'm hoping you could begin with 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 what what I consider to be a pivotal story for Waymo, which is you developed uh, your first driverless car in I think late 29 or or, or two, sorry 2009 2010, and by 2012. Okay. We're doing these pilot projects, allowing Google employees, so people that had nothing to do with the with the self driving project, you're allowing them to commute with their vehicles. Sorry, with your vehicles, um, telling them, you know, under no circumstances should you, uh, you know, not be overseeing the vehicle. You need to be doing that. But look how cool this is. Um, you know, let's do some tests, and you filmed them. And I think the, the when the, when the footage came back to you, it shocked you, and it, and it really put Waymo on a different trajectory. So, do you want to tell us that story? Yeah, yeah, and, and maybe just uh, the, the, the tiniest bit of context too. So you're right, Patrick, the, the project started in 2009. And by 2010, this scrappy little team of 20 to 30 folks had done some pretty extraordinary demonstrations of fully autonomous driving. Um, famously, there were 10 100 mile challenges uh, that the team was able to compete in the first year and a half or two years. Um, one of them included driving all around your neighborhood in San Francisco and then over to Lombard Street. And there was another challenge that went from Mountain View up El Camino all the way, 222 stoplights or whatever it was to uh, to San Francisco. The team drove around Tahoe, the team drove to Santa Cruz. So they, they made a lot of progress in demonstrating the promise of the technology, right? And, and so at the time, Google's thought was, well, what's the first viable at scale commercial product? The initial hypothesis was, ironically, um, something called autopilot, the team called it autopilot. Um, and it was meant to um, command the car very safely, to drive the car very safely um, from uh, entry point to a highway or freeway to exit point. And so in Google fashion um, at the time, uh, the company asked for volunteers um, within Google. We call this internally uh, in the Google world dog fooding. Um, and lots of people were interested in this, in this possibility. You'd get a free car. At the time, uh, the team was putting um, the, the driving mechanisms and the sensors and the compute onto Lexus um, RX SUVs. Um, and there was a great demand uh, for folks to actually give this a try. Um, so uh, the bar was set quite high. You had to agree to certain stipulations, including an indication that you understood this was beta technology and it might not be perfect, so you needed to stay vigilant. Um, you could take your hands off the wheel, um, but you had to keep your eyes on the road. You had to stay alert, and we'd have cameras in the car to monitor you, and if we saw you misbehaving, we would take away this great privilege, right? Um, so we started the, uh, the project sometime in February, I think it was 2013, um, and within a month, we shut the project down. Uh, because we saw so many examples of humans misbehaving. And it's this fundamental conundrum um, that we face whenever humans are forced to supervise um, technology, right? It's, it's, it's really hard. And as the technology gets better and better, and by the way, this technology that we had at that time was amazing, um, humans tend to check out and just assume that the technology is going to be perfect. Um, so 
in our videos, which which you can find, and Patrick, if you haven't seen them, we can send them to you. I think they're somewhere on our website uh, at Waymo.com. Um, we saw some first indications of concern with um, the folks in the driver's seat turning around to fuss with things in the back seat. Um, we saw one woman putting on makeup um, using an eyelash curler. And the scariest thing we saw was uh, a Googler who was driving to work early in the morning, pre-dawn, um, driving down Highway 280 at about 62 miles an hour, um, who fell asleep um, because they had so much confidence in this technology that had been working for them so well over the course of a week or so, right? They had already checked out. Um, so we shut that effort down and it sort of inspired us to move in a different direction um, to solve for full autonomy, fully autonomous driving. Okay, so let me pause you there. The reason I'm bringing up this seven-year-old story is I feel like it has added urgency now because uh, Tesla, which I guess to some extent is a rival, um, has its own technology also called autopilot, but the latest latest iteration is called full self-driving. And I feel like it's pretty clear they've come to the same uh, you know, fork in the road. They've seen the same problems with automation complacency. And yet they've basically said, you know, we're not taking liability, the driver is, they have some prompts that they agree to, um, and we're gonna allow the system to run and, and they wanna expand it and expand it, um, you know, eventually to potentially hundreds of thousands of vehicles. Um, so based on Waymo's decision, I wanna know to what extent you think that's, that's reckless, because I don't know that regulators and consumers really make distinctions between different self-driving systems. And it, what, what worries me is that if mistakes get made on Tesla's part, and you know these are cars traveling 60 miles an hour, so clearly um, fatalities could be involved, does that not pose a risk that you cast a pall uh, on the entire self-driving industry? Yeah, maybe a, a couple points to make there, Patrick. It is important that we, that we talk about these things. Um, the first is, um, Waymo's mission in the world isn't to be a car company. Our, our product is, is a driver. Um, that's our sole focus. Um, and if you look at the business lines that we are just now starting, uh, for example, the ride sharing service that is fully open, uh, unlimited availability to anyone who's in Southeast Phoenix, you can, you can hail a Waymo, just download the app and a fully self-driving Waymo will, will, will come and, and take you from wherever you wanna go. Uh, from wherever you are to wherever you want to go. Um, so the technology is here right now. Um, yeah. Our key technology is the driver. That's that's the most important point. That's what we're here for. Um, we're not a car company, therefore. So we really don't see Tesla as a driver uh, or as a, as a, as a competitor. Um, rather, we see Tesla and other car companies um, working primarily in this driver assist area, which is important and, and good. And good driver assist technology can save lives. There's no question about it. Um, the challenge, I think, for the auto industry, the traditional auto industry, um, is to ensure that consumers understand the limitations, right? And the conundrum that we saw at Google back in 2013 is, as the driver assist systems get better and better and better, humans will tend to have more propensity to check out and not do as yeah. good a job as supervising that technology. It's, it's, a, it's a challenging conundrum. So the good news right now is that the driver assist systems do need human attention um, and they require constant surveillance and humans are able to stay sufficiently busy for the most part monitoring those things. Um, as they continue to get better though, that's that's the challenge. You would think that, that there would be increased safety, uh, but there's also increased risk at the same time that the human licensed driver in the driver's seat might check out at just the wrong moment when the car needs some help. But do you worry about Tesla being reckless and posing risks that might come back to haunt the likes of Waymo? I think, um, you know, it, it's nothing that we can really control um, at the Waymo side. We're going to do our best, um, you know, to, to speak about our technology and deploy it safely and responsibly. Um, you know, I, I do think it's important for all the participants, both on the driver assist side and the fully autonomous side. Um, to be as precise as possible um, with language, right? And if a licensed driver is required, um, it should be referred to as a driver assist system. Um, if a licensed driver in the car isn't required, which is the only technology that Wayne was working on, then I think then you should call that a fully autonomous solution. Right. Okay, so given um, that you that you went over some of the early facts of you know having a uh, autonomous driver system that could navigate Lombard Street, you know famous tourist windy hairpin turn street in San Francisco, ten years ago, 
Um, what, in a sense, uh, is taking so long for this to sort of conquer cities the way that you know Uber did? I think 100 cities within within four years. Um, and I, I guess what I look back to with Waymo is. In 2018, you ordered 60,000 or up to 60,000 Chrysler Pacificas and up to 20,000 Jaguar I-Paces. But if I look for the latest statistics, the latest I've heard is still around 600 vehicles. I think you probably just haven't updated it and it's more than that. But correct me if I'm wrong, it's not in the thousands. It's not in the tens of thousands. So um, why the postponement in delaying a driverless solution? Look, I think the, the technical challenge that we're talking about is probably the most complex thing that a group of humans have ever tried to do. Um, moving a large physical mass from any point A to any point B um, on the ground with all of the chaos and entropy that's associated with traffic um, is, is an extraordinary task, right? There's no question. Um, and if you look at our timeline, yeah, it, it, it has taken some time. Um, we demonstrated the first fully autonomous ride on public roads back in 2015 in October 2015 in, in Austin, Texas. We're just past the five year mark now. Um, and and you know, if you look at the, the chunks of time since then, Patrick, um, so that was 2015. It took us another couple of years to upgrade that technology um, to our fourth generation. The, that Firefly car was our third generation technology. Uh, the Pacificas that you see driving around now um, in San Francisco, they're the backbone of our service in Phoenix. That's our fourth generation technology. It took us a couple of years um, to have fully driverless capability, fully autonomous capability in Phoenix with the Pacificas um, and our fourth generation technology. That jump was important though, because we went from low speed driving, which was uh, sort of the ODD, um, the operating design domain for, for the Firefly, um, was below 25 miles per hour. It turns out that's the only way um, you can put a car without a steering wheel on the road right now uh, with the federal motor vehicle safety requirements that are out there. We use the neighborhood electric vehicle classification called FMVSS 500. I know I'm getting pretty geeky right now, but that's why the Firefly um, really wouldn't work at scale uh, because it was it was sort of limited to a 25 mile per hour speed, which makes it pretty you know undesirable. Uh, for most city uh, driving and suburban driving. I, I actually didn't know that. I wanted to ask. You know, I spoke to Aisha Evans from Zoox yeah. yesterday, and and they've gone in the direction of you know moving from from Toyotas, uh, just you know ordinary Toyotas that they've outfitted, um, and they're introducing you know in a few weeks their fully driverless solution that doesn't have um, you know steering wheels or a pedal. Waymo's already done that, and then actually moved beyond that back to retrofitting Pacificas and I Paces. So so is is that the answer that it, regulatory? Um, reasons demand demands that there's a steering wheel? Involved? Well, right now, there's no there's no path right now, um, other than a potential exemption path um, to have a full speed vehicle, um, a vehicle that can go over 25 miles per hour um, without okay. a steering wheel or brake pedal. Um, so it, it is one of the reasons we we chose to um, move from a dedicated form uh, format, but really not the primary one, Patrick. Like, um, if you think about the analogy of, of a human driver, uh, a really good human driver with a commercial driver's license can drive a class eight truck, they can drive a motorcycle, they can drive a car, they can drive a bus. Um, that's the analogy that you should think of when you think about the Waymo driver, right? We aspire to drive anything that moves on public roads, buses, trucks, cars, um, whatever. Um, and we don't want to be tied to a single form factor. We're, we're designing this driver so that it can drive just about anything um, without right. too much incremental effort. Um, truly the hardest thing that we're doing, the thing that is 99.9% .9 of the problem um, is the development of the driver. Do you know the old adage um, uh, about teaching a monkey to recite Shakespeare from a pedestal? Um, there are two tasks involved. One is getting the monkey to jump up on the pedestal. The other is getting the monkey to recite Shakespeare. Um, if you're tackling a big problem like autonomous driving, you have to decide what is your focus going to be? Is your focus going to be getting that monkey trained to jump on top of the pedestal? Or is, should you just start with the tougher thing first? And our approach at Waymo has always been the hard thing is replicating the extraordinary capability of the human driver. That's the super hard thing. Um, so that has been our focus. Um, there are lots of wonderful car companies in the world who are happy to partner with us, um, and they're able to provide us those skills that we need um, and the op opportunity to integrate 
our Waymo driver uh, with a multitude of vehicle types. And so where are we at, at, at late uh, 2020? I know that you're a real car guy. I, in fact, I probably should have said in the introduction, I mean, you were formerly the CEO of Hyundai America. I believe you spent almost 15 years at Ford. I've uh, been doing this since the, since the early 80s. Um, yeah. And you must be a good driver. I think you own a Porsche 911. Um, how does the Waymo compete with your own driving capabilities? <laughs> Oh, wait. Um, so the Waymo driver um, is for sure the world's most experienced driver. Um, you know, it, we've driven over 20 million miles, but more importantly, we've driven billions of miles um, in simulation. That's the primary way that we're refining and improving the capability of the driver. Um, you know, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. Um, whether or not I'm a better driver than the Waymo driver, I, I think I would put my bets on, on Waymo. Um, and the reason for that is my the, the thing about human drivers, right? Like we can be great drivers when we're focused. The problem right. is human drivers are human and we lose our focus and our driving ability is often um, uh, tied to things like distractions or lack of sleep or having had a glass of wine or, you know, looking at your phone and responding to a yeah. text. Um, these are the, the failure modes of humans, which uh, the Waymo driver is, is immune to. Is it so that uh, you're, you're testing currently in 25 cities? Um, right now, I think we're some, in something like five or six. We have been across, uh, across 25 different cities um, in our history. Right now we're driving, um, we have the, the service up and running, the Waymo One service up and running in Phoenix. We're doing a lot of driving in San Francisco. We've spent um, a bit of time in Los Angeles this year in the Seattle area in Kirkland. Um, we drive a lot in Detroit and in Arbor. Uh, we've also been in Miami this year and um, the uh, Upper Peninsula uh, in Michigan where we did some winter testing. So we've been all over so, the place. And, um, out of curiosity then, if I, if I take these, these five or six regions and just say, what if Waymo One just launched in all of those cities tomorrow? You know, For some reason you were just mandated to do it. The car sounds like it's capable to handle the challenge, but you're not doing that. So, I mean, what would happen in that hypothetical scenario? Oh, I think in that hypothetical scenario, um, you know, we would, uh, well, first of all, let me, I guess it maybe challenge the context of the question. Um, we, do, we do very well um, where we have um, spent time learning how to drive and mastering that environment. Um, there are different challenges in different locations um, that take time for us to assure that we've got confidence to drive well in all those locations. So I want to go back to, to what we did in, in Phoenix, um, which is sort of flipping the conventional model um, you know, around. What we decided to do in Phoenix to demonstrate that we were capable um, was to share um, with a couple of white papers that we released at the end of October, Patrick. Um, first, our methodology for safe driving. Um, but then the results of all of our driving in, in Phoenix from uh, January 2019 to September 30th, 2020. Um, we drove 10 million kilometers in Phoenix during that period. Um, and we shared all of the contact points that we had um, with the world. There was something like 47 of them um, in total. In each of those 47 cases, there was a human agent um, who had some um, level of fault in, in most cases. Uh, almost all of the fault. But in, in all of those cases, um, the incidents were low speed and relatively low um, damage. And the idea was, um, as opposed to sending out a shiny demo video, uh, trying to demonstrate that the Waymo driver is capable, um, we took the exact opposite approach. This is all of our driving. These were all of the things that happened that weren't ideal. And you know what? Turns out that they're not so bad. Um, so we had that level of confidence in Phoenix um, to make this service fully available to anyone who wants to use it as it is right now, based on that experience. And now as we move to other ODDs, other cities, we wanna have that same level of comfort um, and experience as well. So we would do that uh, before we just said, okay, let's drive everywhere. And so if the tech challenge is largely uh, solvable, you know, like that, that sounds like it's in sight and you've done it for one city and presumably it's just a matter of time before you do it in others. At, at what stage um, does profitability come into play? Because these vehicles are pretty expensive. Um, a lot of research has gone into this. Um, you know, do, do you have a sense of what cost per mile is it to operate these vehicles? And 
are you going to undercut the likes of Uber, Lyft, and taxi services on price? Um, and if so, you know, how does that how does that vary your profitability goals? I mean, is profitability at all on the horizon for the next for the next decade, or is that something? Oh, to think absolutely. About? The, um, the the unit cost economics of uh, fully autonomous driving are really attractive. I think it's um, one of the reasons why um, you know so many investors are are interested in this space. Um, ride hailing miles right now um, have a top line revenue per mile of about two dollars, two dollars plus per mile, depending on the city. Um, and it's very easy um, to imagine a pathway to um, really strong margins um, for businesses like Waymo's uh, with Waymo One. Um, the technology um, costs are something, of course, that we 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 keep tight um, within uh, within Waymo uh, for competitive reasons, but. The cost of the Waymo driver um, is significantly lower um, than I think the expectation is. Um, just to give you a general sense, um, it's it's in the range of, of the cost of the cars that we're driving. Um, so it's it's not an extraordinarily expensive um, piece of technology when integrated with um, an electric vehicle, which is our which is our uh, priority right now to have 100% ZEV fleet. One thing I wonder about is, I mean, do, do you envision a time in, in maybe just, you know, as little as five years where in a particular city um, you are competing with multiple driverless Uber type services? Um, and if that's the case, is there not a risk of that there's sort of a race to the bottom? Is there not in terms of prices? Is there not a risk that the self-driving software that's cost, you know, billions of dollars to develop that it becomes commodified to some degree and that you have to differentiate on something else? Maybe that's comfort or... Or, or timing? I think um, if developing self-driving fully autonomous technology is one of the more challenging things humans have ever tried to do, I think the second most challenging thing might be trying to understand where competitors in the space are and where their capabilities really are. It's, it's fairly hmm. inscrutable, Patrick. It's hard to understand. So um, I, I really don't feel equipped to opine on what anyone else in the space where they might be or how well they might be doing. There's really no way to define it um, without more transparency um, from everyone in the space and understanding um, uh, what their true capabilities are. Um, I have to say though that just based on our experience, we know the challenge. Um, and one of the things we've learned, we've learned to become very humble over these last five years because we understand um, what we might have thought in 2015, we became so much smarter by 2017 when we got um, three fully driverless cars up and running at the same time. It took us another year in 2018 to get 100 fully driverless uh, Pacificas up and running at the same time. Um, and it took us another year to have the confidence to routinely put uh, citizens of Southeast Phoenix uh, into our cars. And it took us another year, right, to, uh, to feel that confidence, to leave it open to everyone. Um, so it's a long road. Um, it's an extraordinary grind. Um, it's extremely expensive to do it well. Um, you need a massive compute power. You need a huge team of really talented software engineers uh, to deliver this. I'm, I'm proud to say Waymo's got an absolutely amazing team. There are now 2,100 Waymonauts um, working to bring this vision of fully autonomous driving to the world. Um, and I'm quite confident we've got the most capable team in the world to make this thing happen. Um, Who is your biggest competitor? What's that? Who, who, who would you call your biggest competitor? Um, as, as I said, it's it, it's impossible to define um, that. I really don't have a good understanding. I'm not sure anyone Have you does. been in, a, in an Argo AI, in a Zoox? I mean, to what extent do the executives allow each other to try, the, to try out their vehicles? Or is that just journalists? Um, let's see. I don't think I've been invited yet um, into any of those cars. But at this point, I'd like to extend an invitation to anyone who wants to drive in a Waymo. Just come down to... To Southeast Phoenix, you could give it a try. Yeah, right. um, well, I guess that <laughs> no special permissions needed. Okay, look, several questions have come in, and there's some overlap in the questions. So let me just try to sort of uh, give you three at, at once. Um, obviously, a lot of them are forward looking. One, one, one question is just how you're going to commercialize your, your, your products. Um, a few people want 
I know it's kind of licensing the technology to, to OEMs to, I guess, offer their own services that would use the Waymo technology, but presumably not be called Waymo One. And someone wants to know, are you working on, you know, what might be called Firefly 2.0? So, you know, are you are you are you going to return to developing your own vehicle um, at some stage? Um, and another question, actually, you know what? The second this is a little bit different. So I'll, I'll let you answer those two first. OK, um, so we've got two, two primary business lines at Waymo. Waymo One uh, moves people and things from, from point A to point B. That's up and running. Um, Waymo Via moves goods. And we have two different um, uh, vehicle types. We're using the Pacificas right now with companies like UPS and AutoNation, um, also in Phoenix. And then we have our Class 8 projects uh, and our wonderful new partner, Daimler Trucks. Um, uh, you know them through the Freightliner brand uh, in the US. Um, we're applying that Waymo driver to Class 8 over-the-road trucking, and we'll be starting um, on Interstate 10 and roads like that in the Southwest um, U.S. So those are the two uh, primary go-to-market modes. Um, folks are always interested in the, in the personal car ownership model, um, and uh, we're working on that with, with our OEM partners right now. Um, it's not priority one for us um, because of the social benefit takes a little bit more time, right? The, the downside of personally owned cars is um, they're only in use for about 5% of their time, right? And so we can't really um, get as much social benefit from the technology as we can in a ride sharing model or in the Waymo via goods movement model. Um, but we'll have that. I think it will be likely a subscription model though, um, where you can subscribe to this car for six months or a year. Um, and then after that period, that car will move into a Waymo One-like service uh, where the rest of the mileage um, and lifetime of the car can be consumed uh, very efficiently. We imagine getting 300,000, 500,000, maybe up to a million miles uh, in total from these cars, um, which is going to help drive down those uh, unit costs that we talked about earlier, Patrick. It's, it's going to be a relatively trivial um, aspect of the total cost stack, uh, the cost of the car and the cost of the driver when you look at it over a, a very high number of miles. This other audience question was, if you were restarting now, what would you do differently? Restarting, um, going all the way back to the, the chauffeur stage. Um, you know, I think our journey um, was a fairly efficient journey, although it doesn't seem like it. Um, you know, I, 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 I definitely would imagine um, thinking more deeply about the Firefly or not. In the end, I think it served a really good purpose. It became an avatar uh, for the space um, and an emblem that everyone could look at and, and provided some awareness to the, the work that we were doing at that time, even as a very small entity. Um, so I don't know, no, maybe no, no significant changes to uh, the approach we've been taking. We've always had the uh, motivation to move people and goods. That's always been part of our mission. Um, and we really haven't changed that, even in the midst of COVID. Um, I think it reinforced the need to deploy the Waymo driver flexibly so that it could move both people and goods from the very start. And I think the vision that we've had of um, flexibly applying the Waymo driver to a lot of different vehicle form factors um, is a really robust approach. I think it makes sense. We somehow are already down to just two minutes left. I feel like we've just started. How can that be? Um, How can that be? One thing I want to know, I mean, obviously the biggest congratulations ever for being sort of first to launch uh, a true service, you know, driverless for ordinary passengers in Phoenix. But I would not, would not be sure if people in Arizona that can use the service would consider it, you know, uh, a sort of transformational to their lives. I mean, I could be wrong there, but like, you know, when we think of a self-driving future, we, we, you know, we're often thinking about like entire cities could be uh, reshaped, right? We wouldn't need so many parking spaces and things like that. So, what I, I don't, I'm just curious as to whether there's a, a disconnect there between, you know, being able to launch this service in many cities and when we get the sort of revolutionary impact. I mean, is that is that decades into I the think, future? Or how do you, you know, how do you think it, about it's that? Definitely not decades. I think one of the cooler things about um, the launch in Phoenix is, you know, we've got well over a thousand riders. Um, they've taken tens of thousands of rides. Um, and for them, it does feel um, just normal. Like it's, it's pretty extraordinary. Um, we didn't focus our launch on tech enthusiasts. We focused our launch on the general population of folks who might need to move from point A to point B and for whatever reason, didn't want to drive themselves. 
Um, so to me, it's sort of cool um, that it's just become this thing that's part of their daily lives now. Um, I do think the revolutionary aspects that you're talking about we'll see more frequently as we begin to stay at scale in cities like San Francisco, Patrick, you'll feel that more. Um, I see the time ticking down as well. Um, Patrick, I hope this is okay. Um, but I, Go I, I got to see in the pre-show, um, that you have a new, um, a new addition to your family. And we talked a little <laughs> bit about, the, uh, the little, um, wallet card. Yeah, I have a at home. yeah, we wanted to, to give you this, this is a Waymo onesie. Um, we give this to, um, all of the Waymonauts who are, who are making new humans. And what's cool about right. this set is there's this newborn size. Uh, this is the six month size. Now you get a sense for, um, you know, the size that your, your new child is going to have. That's the, uh, 18 months and, and beyond size. So, um, we aim to, to keep your sweet little child, uh, in Waymo wear for at least the first couple of years of life. I hope that's okay. Well, look, uh, the, I'm, I, I know we're a minute over, but I, but I feel like people are willing to listen to John Patrick. So maybe that's okay. I just want to throw in a last question, which was that, you know, I, I don't know to what extent Chris Erickson was your predecessor or, or, you know, something along those lines at, at, uh, well, he's the Google self-driving project, but he had said, I think in 2016, that he had a 13 year old and his goal was that his son would, would never uh, get his driver's license. You know, it was a Ted talk. I think he was partly making a joke, but it also speaks to me of, of where, how quickly we thought this was, was happening. So let me just give you far more latitude. This three week old I have, is she ever going to yeah. need a driver's license? You know, how much is really going to change in the next 15 and a half, well, I guess it really is 16 years. She w she absolutely will not need a driver's license. I can say that with 100% confidence. There are gonna be so many different mm. um, modes of transportation available. I mean, if she wants to, she can get one. And Patrick, I'm glad you mentioned that um, I, I do love cars and I love driving cars still. We're always gonna have personally owned cars. There's there's no concern about that. And by the time she's driver's, driver license uh, age appropriate, um, she'll be able to use Waymos in, in just about any place that she might be. Um, there may be other companies as well that provide that service, but she'll also have access to cars that have the ability to convert, I think, um, into a true L4 um, experience. I think we'll have cars like that, the subscription model uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, that's one less thing for you to worry about. And as, <laughs> as, as a parent who got through two kids through the driver's license age, um, I can tell you that it's nice that you won't have to deal with that burden for sure. Okay, so I promise this is the last question, but I would actually question what you just said, which is the idea that um, we'll always be able to drive. I mean, sure, if we're talking you know, closed race circuits and so forth, I, I think that'll always be a possibility. But I suspect that if it's 40, 50, 60 years in the future, you know, time when I, and I hope we're both still alive, um, that once you've determined you know, on a city by city basis that robotic vehicles are truly saving lives and that they're available at scale and that everybody can take them, surely it becomes a logical thing that, that driving becomes banned. I mean, in the same way that, well, I guess it's, a, I was gonna go on the horse analogy. We won't go for that. There's no horses on the highway. <laughs> but I mean, you know, uh, we, we, the last panel I had was already about a dedicated uh, corridor in Michigan that I'm sure you're familiar with that will be sort of exclusive to connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles. And one assumes that that one lane eventually becomes two, eventually becomes three, eventually becomes a whole four lane highway. Um, that actually strikes me as sort of obvious, granted decades into the future, but you seem to, to question that. Yeah, I, well, I, I, I guess I, I agree with the point that there will be some roads um, or some parts of cities more likely um, that exclude um, certain sorts of transportation, perhaps personally uh, owned um, transportation. We're seeing that in some city centers already, um, right? The exclusion of, of cars, which, which would also, I believe, tend to exclude um, fully autonomous cars as well. Um, yeah, I think there will be cases and situations in some areas where perhaps there will be something that says you can't drive a car here if you're, if you're, why not want to humanly drive a car? Um, but I think those will be the exception uh, more than the rule, but we'll see. Um, we'll see. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, we're talking decades in the future. Okay. Well, look, thank you so much, John Patrick. Uh, you know, I believe this is the final, um, uh, you know, this is the wrap up interview for the entire event. All that's left is, is what we're all looking forward to, which is the audience can ask uh, me, uh, Peter Campbell and Joe Miller, the three journalists running this event, any question they want. So I, uh, I encourage everyone to stay tuned and watch that. And uh, thanks so much again to John and look out for a Waymo in a city near you.